It's wonderful to be here and uh, it's certainly wonderful to look out on this number of people taking such a keen interest in such an important topic. My, uh, my background, as Brian mentioned, is in public policy and in a career of nearly 30 years um, advising a succession of Australian governments on public policy issues, particularly economic policy issues, I had reason to consider what might be an appropriate high-level goal for public policy. What should be the purpose of public policy? What objectives should guide governments in the decisions that they take, decisions that affect all living creatures, uh, including, in many instances, creatures not yet born? In that career, I came to the view that governments should seek to ensure that all of the creatures for whom they are responsible have the capabilities to choose a life of value. Capabilities might be described in terms of freedoms and also opportunities. For example, freedoms from deprivations associated with starvation or debilitating physical conditions. Opportunities, for example, the opportunity to obtain a relevant education or the opportunity to engage in commercial activity. Within Australian policy circles, this formulation of the public policy purpose, that is, in terms of capabilities to choose a life of value, this formulation today enjoys widespread support, even if its pursuit has proved elusive for all Australian governments thus far. It's a challenging statement for government policy. Yet, as challenging as it is, it appears quite narrow, most obviously because of its anthropocentric framing. What matters, according to the statement, are the freedoms and opportunities principally of humans. That doesn't mean that the welfare of non-human animals is necessarily ignored, but it does mean that the interests of non-human animals will be assessed only instrumentally, that is, for the contribution that they make to the lives of humans, just like any other thing might make a contribution to the life of a human. Thus, because humans of the future can be expected to value the capability to appreciate the existence of an endangered species, and there's a public policy case for programs, government programs, to protect those species, to prevent them from becoming extinct. And the fact that the mistreatment of non-human animals causes distress to humans provides a sufficient case for animal welfare laws such as we see in Australian states and territories and, of course, in many other places. Even so, this instrumental positioning of the interests of non-human animals is quite unsatisfactory. Consider, for example, the perspective of the utilitarian philosophers. For them, what matters is aggregate welfare calculated as the sum of the welfares of individuals. But what individuals? Which set of individuals? Well, leading utilitarians argue for a universalist perspective, one that gives equal consideration to all. All what? Well, as it turns out, not just all humans. Following the father of utilitarianism, Jeremy Bentham, our own, that is Australian-born, Peter Singer, who I would rate as the leading contemporary utilitarian, reasons that the case for equal consideration, the case for being considered in this set of all who are relevant, the case for equal consideration rests on a shared capacity to experience suffering. Well, non-human animals have the capacity to experience suffering, and we see them suffering every day. Thus, Singer argues, and I would agree, that the utilitarian calculator should account for the experiences of all non-human animals and weigh these with or against the experiences of all humans. 
Utilitarianism has made a very significant contribution to our thinking about animal welfare matters. Yet it too is narrow. It avoids explicit consideration of animal rights. Indeed, it avoids consideration of human rights. Utilitarianism subjugates rights, procedures, rules, and a whole host of other ethical principles to an assessment of their consequences. The rights themselves have no intrinsic value. But for many people, and I suspect everybody in this room, rights do have intrinsic value. For example, most, and I'm sure everybody in this room, would consider that humans should have a right to be protected from torture and from other forms of interference from other humans. But what about non-human animals? Should non-humans, or a subset of non-humans, also be accorded rights instead of being considered merely objects? And if so, what rights? And these are vitally important questions. In principle, there are three pathways by which humans develop answers to challenging questions of this sort. The first is through emergent community values. The second pathway involves codification, perhaps in a national constitution, perhaps in legislation. And the third utilises the common law. None of these pathways leads anywhere without exceptional leadership the sort of leadership demonstrated by this year's Voiceless Animal Law Lecture Series keynote speaker, Professor Stephen Wise. Stephen is president of the Non-Human Rights Project. He's practised animal protection law for almost 40 years throughout the United States. He's a very highly regarded teacher of animal rights, jurisprudence and law in several leading law schools. He's also the author of several authoritative books on animal rights. Stephen spoke, as you've just heard, at the Voiceless First Lecture Series in 2007, and we're absolutely delighted to have him join us again this year. Please welcome Professor Stephen Wise. <laughs> 